They were such masculine environments and I was often the only female reporter there. But you develop this different level of questions that you can ask as a female. You just view things in a different way. We've kind of gone backwards, which you'd think in modern day and age, you'd push forward and everything would develop and it would be better. But actually, the way the cars are now, it's harder to drive them as a female. If you want to get to the height of F1, if you want to be a champion, you have to put everything to one side. He found me collapsed on the floor and I was unresponsive. So he called for an ambulance. I think that's been my biggest battle is that my life will never be exactly the same. I want us to speak openly about brain damage, about how you can start to rewire your brain and how you can adapt to any situation. Okay, good morning there. Jenny Gao, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it really is an honor. Uh, a friend of mine, Craig, he he like tagged me on LinkedIn a while ago, and he's like, "Oh, you should really try chat to this lady." And I was like, "Okay, cool. Let me let me like check her out." And then I was like, you know, doing a bit of research, checking you out, and then um, I was like, "No, I recognize her." Like, you know, and I was like. I've seen her on Sky Sports and and all these sort of things and um, yeah, it's just like a uh, it's just an honor like to to have you on the show. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. It's nice to be here. <laughs> cool. So as you're an extremely like well known face, uh, name, and voice in the world of F1, and your story into F1 was is is pretty cool. Like from my understanding, is you were working for like a lo local radio station. Um, and then you went to a speedway and that was literally, okay, I'm in here now and your passion just started. Can you just speak more about that, please? Yeah. So I've always loved cars. Um, I don't know why, absolutely nothing in the family that would have led me to like cars, but there we go. Um, so it was almost like a natural progression to find my way somehow into working with cars. Um, but it wasn't quite that easy. I did lots of different jobs along the way. I kind of knew I wanted to be a journalist from day one. Um, and I was kind of fixated about being a war correspondent, which is very different from F1 journalism. Um, but I was uh, on the scene of a crash with two cars and after that moment I was like nah not for me I can't deal with that and that was just a, a, a small crash um in like the vicinity of my local village um and yeah that just turned my mind into not wanting to concentrate on the sad bits of life and trying to celebrate humans but in a different way so yeah I followed a path to sports journalism and um, was working, as you say, at a local radio doing the breakfast show. And we had this tie in, this weird tie in that you get with local radio um, that we ended up on a Friday night. Every other weekend, we would go up to the Speedway in Bridgewater, Somerset, um, and we would do some announcing on the microphone there. And I just became like, fascinated with Speedway and riders stories and just the whole the whole event it's a very unique smell and sound um and a producer came up to me and said hey do you want to do some more I was like yes I do sign me up <laughs> wow that's that's so cool it, it almost seems like just so random in in some way and it's amazing <laughs> how this it's led you on this amazing trajectory in your life D were you like you you said you like cars but did you like sport as a girl were you a sporty girl yourself yes um I look at my daughter now and see a lot of myself in her with regards to she likes formula one that goes without saying really in this household um but she also plays football she runs around she wrestles all the time with her dad um so I was very much that child um, and I was, you know, the, the story behind sports people, I find really intriguing 
um, and what drives them, what makes them want to achieve these incredible feats. And that's telling people stories because everyone is unique. Everyone in the world has an interesting story and it's just tapping in to try and find those stories. Yeah, I love that you said that. That's actually one of the, that's been one of the main lessons of me doing the podcast. It's like literally everyone has something interesting inside of them and they don't even realize it, you know? And I think that's a, that's an important thing for people to know. You, you're a unique individual. You have something special about you and you know what? You should also try and share that with the world because if we can all do that, you know, a little bit more of that, then we can make this, uh, make this a better place. So yeah, but I also see you've got a, a Spurs uh, t shirt there. Is that, is that right? In your background? Yep. Yep. That is a Spurs t shirt. It's my husband's. Um, this wall is pretty much, well, a lot of it's my husband's. You can see we're both into F1. So we've got a McLaren. No, where's my finger? Like, this is going back to my days of being a weather presenter. McLaren Lego car. Um, you've got a Mercedes top, which is um, the championship top from Lewis Hamilton. Got a signed picture under that from Lewis Hamilton. And then, yeah, Spurs football top. Is it uh, football or soccer? Well, for me, it's soccer, actually. <laughs> but I don't want to, I don't want to, like, um, you know, I know you, you're, you're British, so we'll have to stick with football. <laughs> um, no judgment here. It's fine. No, no, of course, of course. So I, I was wondering, do you remember, like, your first day? commentating from the pit lane uh yes very much it was um canada 2011 which was kind of a special race it's still the longest f1 race in history hmm, interesting yeah for what reason so sorry it was, um so it was very very long because it was um rain delayed okay. so we kept having rain come and go and then wait for the track to dry out a bit and then the cars would Go around again. So yes, it was a, a very long race with a pause in the middle that was, n now we look at it, it was unacceptable. So the rules have changed since then. So it will always be the longest race in F1 history. Um, but yeah, it was a, a, over four hours. Wow. And, and you must have been nervous, like surely, like, I don't know if you still get nervous, but I um, can imagine your first one, you must have been like, uh oh, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> Yeah, there are so many things to try and remember. Um, you're in a foreign country with people you've never worked with before who have luckily been doing it for years. So they know what they're about. So they were able to at least guide me along the way. But as an F1 reporter um, for BBC Radio, it's quite a slim line staff. So you don't have anyone with you. You're out there on your own with a mic, uh, live to the nation. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot to think about. I'd followed F1 for a long time and I, I did my homework. And I think that's a really important lesson to learn that as long as you sit there and you do your homework, you do all the prep that you think you can to enable yourself to be in the best possible place to succeed, then that's half the work done. Um, so I, I did my prep. I, I was really um, geeky about it. And I bought a little book and I made all sorts of notes. Um, and then all I could do, which is quite lucky in a way, is as a commentator or a reporter, all you have to do is say what you see. You're not trying to rewrite history. You're not trying to do anything out of the box for that first one. Just take it easy and literally say what you see. Give the audience that color, that flavor of, of where you are and why you're there. That's a really nice segue because one of the things I wanted to ask you, or just first of all say, is like the skill that you have as a radio presenter is underrated, I think, because you have to bring to life for people that are only listening like you have to bring to life what, what you're seeing, but so that they also see it. You know what I mean? Like, is there anything in particular, like any skills or advice that you have for anybody when it comes to doing that? Um, well, that's a good question. I think it comes down to having a good understanding of language so that you don't use the same words all the time. 
um, and having having that ability to flick through a dictionary in a way in your head and using those words uh, um, and almost writing poetry when you're speaking. Um, I mean, that comes with time. Um, you improve your di dialect and and you've got a better lexicon to go to to paint that picture. But it is like it's like um, painting my numbers. You start out using re really big blocks of color and trying to find out which colors work together and how to blend those. And the more experience you get, the more fine those little sections of color get and the more inherent it is that you just know how those colors work. And it's a bit like that with presenting and radio especially, that you just, you just understand it more and you're able to do it better. Yeah. Um, I was also then like wondering, was that something you were always like interested in? Like was uh, English and say, you know, like being a good speaker or, or you know, was, was that, was, did you grow up like reading a lot of books? Like, Yeah, um, I was always reading um, or writing. Uh, I did English up to quite a high level. And I love debating. I don't know what it's like with you, but we don't have debate squads or teams um, in the UK. It's it's an underrated skill. Um, but I was lucky and I did um, English literature. And we used to debate the books a lot. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think, yeah, I've never really thought about it, but obviously your past forms your future. And yeah, I was, I just loved it. It's funny because when I was at school, we actually had uh, like debating as a, it was, it was almost a, you had debating like within the school, like an actual. Uh, oh, I'm so like, envious. Yeah. But then you also had like, you had, uh, you had like inter school debating and, but you all like, I was a sports guy, right? And I was like, these guys are such nerds. <laughs> 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 but looking back now, I'm like, I wish I was in the debating team. Like, and, and, and I, I, I really wish like, everyone was actually taught how to debate because, you know, especially you see now in this day and age, well, people don't even know how to talk to each other. They don't listen to each other. They, they can't even hold their own side of a conversation. Um, yeah, I think it's such an amazing skill. I, I think that more people should actually learn is debating. Anything that we thought was geeky when we were growing up probably turns out to be the best thing we could have done, but we were having too much fun doing other things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so just talking about, I guess, um, you know, going into a, into a new role, um, there's, there's enough sort of stress there just starting something new, but, but you going into a sort of man's world as a woman, like how was that kind of received? Um, so I never really thought about it. I was, a, I was a, not a girly girl. I was always hanging out with the lads. Um, and I, I never thought, oh, I want to go into this to prove a point or to, oh, there's not very many women in that. I, I can succeed in there. There was never any thought of that. I just did what I was passionate about and never really thought it was going to be more of a battle because I was female. But the more sport I did, the more I understood that actually the way people talk to you can be a massive disadvantage but also a massive advantage because as a woman going into say a football club or a soccer club um that's how I started field reporting and I was going into Southampton FC and Bournemouth and Portsmouth at the time and they were such masculine environments and I was often the only female reporter there but you develop this kind of I, th I suppose a different level of questions that you can ask as a female you just view things in a different way and I think a lot of the time at, at this point in my career all the guys were just asking very similar questions very factual very statistic led um, to arm themselves best for the weekend whereas I came in it from a very personality driven um, background and questioning so they were very different approaches to how we report on the sport and I, I could only see that as an advantage and yes it was hard sometimes and yes you got called names and you got 
um, a lot of the time the guys were just a bit mean or they mansplained to you or, you know, you were very much out of your comfort zone. But that just drives me. It makes me want to do better. It makes me want to achieve more. It makes it makes me want to prove a point. So to that extent, I was trying to prove myself, but only to be as good as everyone else, not better, not different. I just wanted to be doing the best job I could. I heard you say something really interesting in one of the podcasts you've been on about a woman in motorsport. And I think this might even be in your book. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that in the 50s and 60s, there was actually women that were competing in, in F1. Um, and obviously now that's completely different. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's so weird. We've kind of gone backwards, which you'd think in modern day and age, you'd push forward and everything would develop and it would be better. But actually, the way the cars are now, it's harder to drive them as a female. Um, and the stepping stones up to being an F1 aren't much harder now. Um, cars don't have power steering until you get to F1. So as a, as a young kid going through the development stages of F1, you go to like feeder series and those feeder series don't have the equipment you need to be able to drive that car the best way you can as a female. So I think power steering has really um, helped women, but actually it's hindered them in, in the same time because they can't develop as well because um, it just needs more strength. Um, and you have to train in a, in a very certain and particular way to be able to drive a car. And it's just developing those core muscles, um, but not bulking out too much. So it's a really, being a driver is a very um, specific way of training and developing. Um, but in the 50s, 60s, the cars, they were just the same for everyone going through every rank. So you, you just you get more chances for a start. Um, there were more cars. I mean, there haven't been, uh, I would say, hugely successful females in that arena. There have been, there's been one woman who scored half a point. Um, because back in the day, they gave out more points or they gave out less points and you just had to be lucky. That all through the course of F1 history, there have been different points awarded at different times. Um, and I don't know. I don't really know why there's been this gap of talent coming through to F1, but it, it's such a shame that we don't have a women succeeding at the, at the top level because unless you see it, it's really hard to be it. And um, there are lots of play quote. There are lots of programs now that will help develop female talent, but it's been a long time coming. That's interesting because I was actually talking to my wife, uh, wife about it. She, uh, she was asking that question as well. And, and that was literally my answer. I was like, I think there's probably not a uh, woman competing in F1 because it's, it's the physical side of things. It can't be anything else because to fit in those cars, like you actually have to be quite slight anyway. You know, you're not like this big, strong person. So you have already you're a girl. So already you're not say like as strong as guys physically, um, but you're also very small, right? So it's even like more of a, a sort of disadvantage there. So it, funnily enough, yeah. that's the weird thing. You're perfectly proportioned as a female because you're slight and you don't get that bulk of muscle building. So actually proportionately you're best fit for a car, but you have to control your hips and that's the problem uh, with a lot of females. As they get older, their hips get wider, which is a natural occurrence. And it's really hard to get those hips smaller. It does it's just an, 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 that's hard for me to say, anatomical issue. Um, and I think when you delve down, I think, I think it is possible for females to succeed in F1 but I think they just need to train earlier and better. And no one was out there saying, this is the way to train, to drive. There hasn't been that sort of programming where there has for men. 
and boys coming through. So I think starting younger, it's just a numbers game in F1. To get there, you have to start karting. At some point in time, you have to do karting. And there aren't enough girls coming through the karting scheme to give you enough girls to develop to the top level. They all fall away because there just aren't the numbers. So put more uh, girls into karting and those programs that will train them to be good karters, then eventually, if the numbers even up a little bit, you'll see more females progressing. Just talking about like skills in general, how underestimated are the skills of F1 drivers? I mean, like, let's be honest, like any professional sports, you, you watch them on TV, or at least I do, because, you know, I'm a bloke and like I, I watch them and I'm going, yeah, I could probably do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's no chance I could ever do it. You know what I mean? Like I'll watch the rugby and I'll be like, yeah, maybe I could, you know, <laughs> but I definitely couldn't. <laughs> and um, you watch F1 and you're like, yeah, those guys, are they're really good, you know, but it can't be that hard. But I mean, it is really that hard, isn't it? Like how underestimated are their skills? I think it's like when you watch um, Olympic diving and every four years you watch the diving, you go, oh, that looks quite easy. Uh, but you don't understand actually what's going on behind what you see. There's so much control. There's so much repetition. There's so much practice. And there's the fine tuning of a, 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 an elite athlete. We can't appreciate exactly what they're going through and how much they dedicate to their sport it's incomparable and if you want to get to the height of f1 if you want to be a champion you have to put everything to one side and i mean almost everything um i remember speaking to one driver and he said there's no room for love in f1 and that was the limit he took it to in that year he could not love anything other than him F and F1. And to put your sights on being a champion in F1, you have to dedicate your whole self. And from a very early age, you have to train yourself to just focus on driving. So school goes out the window. Maybe they do four days a week through their season of karting because on Fridays, they're competing. Maybe on Thursdays, they're competing. So they have to homeschool. That's the level that people take it to. And you are, you're not trying to get as strong as you can, because that won't help you in an F1 car. You have to tailor your body. You have to be the best at driving that car, whatever car it is. Each year, the car changes. So it's just those small details. The margins of error are tiny. And the risk that you have to take to just break that one meter later, to get your foot down on the gas that one meter earlier, to go that f level faster than your opponents, you're talking a really, really fine margin. And the, and the further we get in F1 and its story, the more the drivers um, want to fine tune themselves so it's diet, it's exercise, it's rest, it's recovery, and you repeat it day in, day out. And reaction time is so um, instrumental to getting a good start. There's just so much going on within an F1 car, even the levels of G that they're taking, communication with their team, their race engineers. There's a whole world of people supporting that driver. So there's a lot of expectation on an F1 driver. I heard someone speak, you know, not too long ago about uh, jealousy and they said, if you are jealous about somebody's like life or say like, you know, an F1 driver, you must be jealous of their whole life. Right. So in this instance, like people, I don't think they understand the sacrifice and the discipline. Like you said, like whoever that driver was, he's like, there's no, there's no, he can't love anybody. He can't do anything else. He has to be absolutely precise with everything in his life. Like, He's 100% dedication. So that means there's, there's nothing else, you know, and is that really what most people want? No, I don't think so. Um, so yeah, definitely amazing sportsman that, uh, yeah, on totally the, the highest pedestal. I was wondering if you have like a greatest moment in F1 that you've experienced. Oh my goodness me. That's so hard because you get so many great moments in F1. 
and I've been lucky to, you know, every year you get a champion. So you're there when a champion is crowned, which is amazing. Um, you're there when great tragedies happen as well. It's such an emotional sport that has great highs, but terrible, overwhelming lows. Um, it's really, I think being, I don't know if you could call it a great moment in the sport, but being at the 2021 Abu Dhabi final, when, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of views on that, but it was a very controversial end to the season. It was Lewis Hamilton versus Max Verstappen. Um, and the race was settled in the um, steward's office. Um, and I mean, they went into that race tied on points. So it was really winner takes all. There was so much at stake. It would have been Lewis Hamilton's eighth title, Max Verstappen's first title. Um, so you can see that the different pressures on those two men going into that race and the expectation. And yeah, it was it wasn't a great time in F1, but it was amazing to live through that and be there and see the drivers and the teams go into the stewards come out of the stewards no one knew what was happening there was you know it, it felt like high stakes high fever there was a lot of adrenaline and I was there reporting on it and it was a, an amazing experience to be there at such a crucial point in F1. When you heard the result did you jump up or were you disappointed? When I heard the result I immediately dragged, I was with another presenter at the time, I dragged him and went, run. And he didn't know the world of F1 so well, but as soon as we heard the start of a ripple of success and, and clapping, then I just ran through to the pit lane, through to the grid, um, and Max Verstappen was there on the shoulders of his mechanic celebrating, and I just dove through, um, and uh, as soon as he had finished celebrating, I, I just cued him from my presenter at the time and said can we just have a quick word so we managed to get the first interview with him after he was crowned like official champion um and that that was a good high um I think you still have to be um very unbiased you have to remain as a presenter for the BBC. You have to have that focus and, and not get swayed one way or the other. You just have to report on the facts and bring the story to life. I think that must be like such a difficult thing, you know, because at the end of the day, you are human. Uh, you're also British, you know, like, you know, um, and it, it must just be very hard to separate those two things sometimes, like the facts from your heart. Uh, yes, and I'm quite an emotional person. Now, after a stroke, I'm even more emotional, which can be a problem. Um, but I think I think professionalism runs quite hard through my core. I really want to do a good job. I mean, I sound like the biggest geek in the world here. Um, but yeah, I want to do a good job. And not everyone listening is a Lewis Hamilton fan. Um, not everyone listening is a Max Verstappen fan. So you have to reflect that. But equally, I still think what happened that day wasn't right. And I think both, both drivers did everything they could. They didn't do anything wrong, neither of them. But the result of that was wrong. Um, and I, I strongly believe that. But it, it's, not, it's not for me to, I don't know, I can have an opinion, but it doesn't count for anything. It's just my opinion. Talking about the pit lane, how hot does it get in the pit lane? <laughs> um, I'm lucky. I don't have to wear a fire suit. I don't have to wear a helmet. Um, I can just saunter up and down there with a little tabard over my normal clothes. Um, so, yes, it can get hot, but just as hot as it does in a hot country, like Malaysia, let's say. That's one of the hottest places we go to. Um, or Qatar, when the sun is shining down. But I'm always aware that I'm never as hot as the drivers or the guys who are engineers and mechanics. And the mechanics who do the pit stops, they have to wear fire suits. They have to wear the Nomex protection underneath them. They have to wear a full helmet. Um, yet that is hot. And, and sometimes the drivers can lose kilograms of weight just through sweats every race. So, yeah, you have to be aware that I'm quite lucky, whereas they uh, have to go to extremes 
I can imagine it's like quite a fun experience for those uh, those people uh, like taking off their outfits <laughs> after after a race. It's like you got this sweat dripping down your body, but you you almost can't take off your you know those everything they're wearing. It's uh, yeah, I'm sure it's, that's a bit of an experience. I've got it. This is maybe a bit of a strange question. I was wondering, like, what is it like traveling around the world with like three thousand other people that are also part of you know, all of F1, every single race, like, like what's the setup? Like, how do you do it? Do you, do you go individually? Do you go as teams? Uh, so it changes year in, year out. I used to go as with a little, little team. Um, but the less, uh, the BBC sends out to races now. So a lot of the time I'll just go by myself. Um, but you do end up budding up with people. You've known these people your whole career. And there are a lot of F1 lifers, I call them, who have been in the paddock ever since they started. They haven't missed a race, some of them, at all. And that's quite incredible. Um, I, I mean, that's dedication that I just don't have. But, um, or time, or money, or, you know, there are lots of different contributing factors to why 24 races is too many for the people actually traveling around to them but it's an amazing experience and you end up having like your f1 family and your actual family um they're there in at highs and lows you know it's tiring traveling the world seems like this glamorous lifestyle but actually for anyone who's done it you know that it's it's hard it's tough um you know, you're stuck in coach, traveling to Australia, let's say, um, you get there, you go straight to the track with your suitcase still in your hands, you're straight into reporting from the pen, then you have to go out to eat because obviously you need to eat. Um, and anyone that's done a business conference, even at home, will know that yes, going out for a meal is nice with your uh, colleagues, but actually, Sometimes you just want to sit at home and have a jacket potato and not talk to anyone. And you can't do that when you're on the road. So yeah, there are, there are plenty of things I love about it. Don't get me wrong, but it is hard. Yeah. It's another one of those scenarios where the grass is definitely not greener and it's, it is tough. Like traveling with work, it, it can also be a little bit lonely, even though you're there with your, you would say your teammates uh, and your F1 lifers, like you're not there with your family, your actual family, family, you know, so you miss them. And um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's definitely not that easy. Your life changed Jenny on, I think it was the 29th of December, 2022. You were, you'd been sick for about a week and you were, you went downstairs into your downstairs bathroom and you fell over. And I was just wondering if you can sort of take us through that, that event. Yeah. So it was, as you say, in between Christmas and new year, um I had a flu um and I just thought it was like one of those winter colds that you get didn't think anything of it I was pretty sick but um I mean I was that sick that I didn't actually drink through Christmas which is quite a thing for me so you know I must have been pretty poorly um and yeah I'd um I'd gone to the doctors they weren't particularly worried um but that morning I was I didn't feel any worse than I had the day before um, but I came downstairs and yeah, collapsed. And luckily my husband was here um, and he, he heard a thud. Um, and I assume he just probably shouted my name. And when I didn't get back to him, he came looking. Um, and we have a, at the time, six-year-old girl. So no toilet doors are ever locked. So you can never get privacy, which is a good thing this time. Um, so yeah, he found me collapsed on the floor. Um and I was unresponsive. So he called for an ambulance um, and he was talking to the um, operator on the phone um, and going through a series of questions that they ask you. Um, and it soon became apparent that I was showing signs of having had a stroke. And I was 45 at the time and I wouldn't have known what the symptoms are, what, the, what you should do if someone's having a stroke, um, apart from the obvious, which is call for an ambulance. And luckily we live quite close to a hospital. So the ambulance was here, I think within minutes. Um, 
you know, certainly within a quarter of an hour, the ambulance was already there here. Um, and a stroke is, I mean, it's one of the major killers in the world. Um, it's certainly the thing that causes the most disability worldwide. Um, and so the seriousness, it's like a category A and they get you to hospital as soon as they can. Um, so I was rushed into hospital um, and they diagnosed a stroke quite quickly. So they give you like a blood thinning medicine or uh, I think it's a clot busting drug. That's the word they always use on the TV. Um, and yeah, I was transferred up to another hospital, operated on all within about four hours, which is a time limit they like to treat you with if you're having a stroke. And the more um, lengthy that process is, the more damage will happen to your brain. So they managed to go in, remove the clot. Um, and yeah, that's when recovery starts. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a, I think more scary for my husband and my daughter. Um, I didn't really know what was going on, but yeah, I couldn't speak um, for the next six days. I found it hard to communicate. I had right side paralysis. Um, I didn't have any pain, which sounds so weird, doesn't it? If you think about a stroke, you think, oh, may they must be in pain. But I didn't really have any pain that I was aware of. I just, I just couldn't speak and I couldn't move properly. Um, and I, I, a stroke, I think, is a bit like if you unplug your computer and then plug it back in. That's what it felt like. It felt like I had to start from scratch again. Um, and you can sometimes hear and see that my voice isn't quite right now and we're almost two years down but um yeah it's it's not something i'd recommend yeah absolutely well you've made a miraculous recovery if i if i do say so uh, and it's it's amazing how those minutes can make a difference such a difference you know like if that ambulance hadn't showed up like within 15 minutes we, you know, we might, we might not even be having this conversation. You know what I mean? Like it's, it literally is, wow. Uh, sort of, I guess in some ways life and death, the, the difference in time. And, and that's why like emergency services, I have such massive respect for like those people operate on a whole nother level of, of everything. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. So lucky that they, they were there so quickly, especially at that time of the year as well. But like you said, your it's often your family actually, or the people that this that it doesn't happen to that you know almost end up struggling a little bit more because they see you um you're not really sort of coherent you don't know really what's going on and then they have to you know they play a big hand in i guess helping you what what were your husband's and and your daughter response to it um you're right they were there to support me and um prop me up i, I think my daughter came in the ambulance with us um to the hospital and she was there in the relatives room when my husband was being briefed by the doctors because what else can you do at that point in time um so I think she was exposed to quite a lot and conversations that I think my husband would have in an ideal world not chosen to have had with her present but she's resilient as most kids are they're tough little knights um and and she rallied we actually spent a lot of time uh, doing like homework together um, through rehab. Uh, so she was a great help and just wanting to get up and do stuff for her. I think as a parent, you are inherently driven to protect even when bad stuff's going on with you. So I think that forced my recovery at the early stages because I wanted to get up and say goodnight to her simple things like that forced you to move and I think that's a really important part of recovery you just have to keep moving and not lie down and wait for it to come to you so I chased my recovery really hard and my husband was able to have the time to enable me to do that uh, his employers were Sky still are um, and he works at Sky F1, uh, it's a small world. Um, and they were amazing. They gave him all the time off, said, you know, you just stay at home, look after Jen. Your family needs you now. 
and don't think about work and and having that freedom to you know be able to go shopping to do all the chores to navigate insurance companies and um all of those things that I used to do running the house he had to take over without any warning without me being able to communicate with him um and you know it was a really hard period but also a really amazing one because we were together as a family and we don't do that you know I'm traveling he's traveling um Isabel's at school you know our family works together in unison but not very often together (laughs) so yeah it was you have to look at some of the positives and I take that as a positive and you had to learn how to read and write again is that correct yeah (laughs) speak write read and how, how did you like how do you learn that again with the help of some amazing people um so I had therapists coming into the house um and the NHS which is a health service here in the UK were amazing you know they they really gave me all the tools to try and succeed so I went away from hospital still struggling to say any words um and quite wary of being discharged early on um because the intensity of my rehab wouldn't be as much as if I was at hospital but the need to come home and see my daughter was greater so we took that gamble and just prayed that it would work um and so we had a team of people who would come to the house um and I left the hospital with like a really thick wadge of um information Um, questions that I had to answer, things I had to write down to just try and switch on my brain and make new pathways in my head. Um, And the brain is an amazing thing. So it relearns or it learns new pathways. So that was the job that I had, basically switch your brain on and form these new pathways, these new neurons and try and try and learn all of the things that you basically you you'd forgotten not that you'd forgotten it had been wiped that's a more accurate way of saying it and one of the decisions you also made was to actually like talk about your stroke talk about brain damage rather than kind of like stay in the background because you know there is a, a stigma attached to it and uh, i think it was like a really brave decision to start talking about it I don't know why. I just felt like I I needed to share what was going on because I'd never heard of someone my age having a stroke. Um, and I didn't know anyone who'd had a stroke. I'm, I, in a way, I'm lucky that I didn't have that experience. But actually, I think it's one of those um, illnesses, even, even knowing what to categorize a stroke as. It's not a disease. It's it's not really an illness. It's something that strikes you down. Um, but it's more than an ailment. Even the fact that we don't exactly know how to categorize it says that we don't speak about it enough. And I just felt like, yes, I could have gone away and had, you know, a year and a half off work and then just come back. But actually, why do I, why should I hide this? And, and what, what would be better would be to share this experience and inform people that this can happen. And when it does, it's devastating. And, you know, I've, I've had a good recovery so far, but not everyone is as lucky as that. And I'm very aware that if you spend longer being diagnosed, if you're misdiagnosed, which happens a lot, um, you know, every second counts. And for some, they will die. And for others, they will have um, so much trauma to, in their brain that they will never make a full recovery. So it, it's really it's really important for us to talk about strokes, the effect of them, how to recognize them, 
um you know there, there's um there's be fast is the wording that we use now um which is stands for balance eyes face have to remember them all arms speech and time and all of those things if you feel something's not quite right um, if you notice your face starting to droop or someone else's, if they can't raise their hands properly, you need to act fast to be able to get them to help and to spot the signs of a stroke. And some of those like balance and eyes are really difficult. Blurred vision can be a thing when you wake up, let's say, or you might have a banging headache just because, or it could be the signs that you're having a stroke. So it's really hard for emergency departments to correctly diagnose, but it, it's if you feel something's not right, it's really important to seek help. One of the things that sort of happens when you have these big life events is that you, you effectively start seeing the world differently, or at least your maybe role in the world. How, how what has been like the experience for you? So in all honesty, I don't think I've had like, a light bulb moment where I thought, oh, I know my destiny now. I can su succeed and fulfill this. I need to go and climb a mountain or I need to go and start a horse farm. I, I, I haven't had that. But I think that's because actually the reality is I quite like what I do. <laughs> so I didn't need to rewrite it. I just needed to learn it again. So I think that's been my biggest battle is that my life will never be exactly the same um hopefully it, it's better um in some ways but I I still get so frustrated and so upset about I, I just think the emotions after a stroke really come to the surface they're they're right here um so yeah I cry a lot and and it's not about a, a pity party or anything like that I just I just cry. Um, so, yeah, there are things that frustrate me, but I think looking at the positives, the time spent with my family that I wouldn't have had because um, I was always on the go before, and this has had to, you've had to slow down. Um, and the fact that now I feel like I've got another purpose. I, I'm not just here to be a, a mom and a, and a wife and, that side of things and I'm not just here to talk about F1 now I have you know a small platform but it is a platform nonetheless and you know I want to make a change for people and I want us to speak openly about brain damage about how you can start to rewire your brain and how you can adapt to any situation and and use this to yeah get the conversation about stroke out there more I think sometimes it's not obvious, like when these things happen, you know, and it's definitely not obvious, like sort of straight afterwards, or even a few years afterwards, but you might just realize, oh, you know what, actually that, that, that uh, impacted my decision-making, you know, like I, I made a different decision like now to what I would have made five years ago, like say five years ago, you would have definitely have gone to the next race, but now you're like, you realize how precious life is and you're like, actually, I'm not going to go to this race. I'm going to hang out with my wife and daughter. Uh, sorry, my, my husband and daughter. Um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I think, I think subtly it's, it changes you in, in that sort of way where it's not always a conscious thing. Yeah, absolutely. And this whole process has taught me that I'm really driven. Like I, I, I wouldn't have backed myself before, but now I think, you know, I, there wasn't a day, not one single day after the stroke that I didn't try to get up, to to do something, to learn something, to write something. Um, and I, I honestly would have loved to have sat on the sofa and watched some TV and just switch off and just relax and have a little bit of downtime. But it didn't happen. And it, I, you know, I expected when something like that happens, you expect to like have a bit of bed rest and no, 
no, I was straight up on my feet. The physios were there. I had to walk up and down stairs, had to relearn simple things like how to make a cup of tea. Like I didn't have that knowledge. So I had to learn and you have to then balance things. And I kept dropping everything at the start. So yeah, even the simplest of processes had to be relearned. So there was no time to just relax. And it, it sort of like ties in nicely with what you said earlier about recovery. Recovery is actually active. You know, it's not, not a passive thing. Like you, you, if you want to get better quicker, you actually need to be doing things. And uh, so, so it's fortunate that you hit you, that you, this tenacious woman and you, and you're like, I'm going to get after it because you know, the alternative is, is that I just sort of decay away in, in some ways. So yeah. Yeah. Congrats to you. I think it's, I think it's incredible. So not, not only did you, you know, you had one of the sort of um, things, I think uh, side effects maybe is a better word that uh, of your stroke was uh, you suffered from dyslexia, right? And then you decide to write a book. <laughs> so um, talk about uh, challenging yourself. I, I love it. Uh, and, and it's literally been published this week, which is just seriously amazing. Like, well done, like what an achievement. I have it. There Look, there it cool. is. like a, a real thing with my name on it and everything. It's it's so amazing. That's how to real. read F1. So like, how does a book like that come about in a time of your life like that? Um, it was about six months, I think, after my stroke. And I got an email from work um, from the BBC saying, do you fancy writing a book? <laughs> Right on the emails, you do know I've had a stroke. Um, and by the way, the emails weren't that far. I was like one finger, one thumb texting back. It was painful. Um, but my exercises were to send three messages, of WhatsApp messages or texts a day and just build up the memory of how to send stuff. It was, it was crazy. Um, so, of course, I said, yeah do you know I've just had a stroke and I, I don't think I'm the best person to do this for you um and they said just have a chat just have a chat with the publisher and see what you think and lovely lady called Nell convinced me that I could possibly write an A to Z of F1 and because it was A to Z there's no flow to the plot so I didn't have to remember what I'd written already I just had to go with it um, and embrace the letters. Um, so it's quite good for me to relearn the alphabet, which I still struggle with. Uh, my daughter is far better at that than I am. Um, and to open my laptop and to try and write again. Uh, so I wrote A and I were the first letters that I tried. And I sent them back to Nell and expected a big fat no. Because, I mean, some of the writing was just gobbledygook. You couldn't make out the words. Um, but I don't know how. But she said, yeah, we like it. So, I mean, they did have to spend some time copy editing it. But they do with every book. Um, but I think the dyslexia was hard and not being able to read the words back was really hard. So I had a program that read the words back and then I could correct them. Um, so it was a long process, but it, it really helped me have a goal every day. So I'd wake up, do some exercises and then come into this room and just type. And it's funny, the, the words and the memories were in there I just needed to tap into them to be able to write the book. So it was really good practice. I mean, 600 words a day, which seems impossible, but actually I was over target by the end and had to edit loads down. Um, and yeah, I, I wrote a book, a Recovering from a Stroke. And I think, honestly, it was one of the best things that happened to me through my recovery because it, it gave me a focus and it made that part of me that was missing F1 and my F1 family, it brought me together with them. And I was, you know, I love what I do because I'm able to share those experiences of seeing things, of smelling things, you know, everything sensorily that you can try and share. Um, and, and writing the book enabled me to, 
I suppose, still keep that part of my life going. And um, oh, what was I going to ask you? Uh, how, how do you, how, why did you choose like A and I? Like A, maybe it's obvious because it's the first letter, but then, then why I? So I think the first, or I believe the first uh, sounds that I made when I was trying to speak again um, were A and I. So I kind of subconsciously, I think, use those as the starting point. Um, and going through the whole process of learning to speak again as someone who speaks for a living and you can't shut up uh, as I am showing now. Um, it's if I hadn't have had the right nurse on the right day at the right time, I still believe there's a part of me that wouldn't be speaking now. So again, I was fortunate that she just happened to be on the ward and that she was receptive and I was receptive to that. And I, I just tried my hardest. So yeah, yeah that's why A and O, A and I. Yeah. Yeah. M maybe subconsciously the, the AI revolution or what we're going through at the moment <laughs> <laughs> had something to do yeah, with it. Yeah, it must be there stronger. <laughs> yeah. but, but I was just wondering, like, this week you've effectively like started getting feedback and I've been checking, you know, what's been posting on, on Twitter. And I mean, it, it must be almost surreal, but at the same time, just like so heartwarming just to start getting feedback on it. I think I was very nervous about F1 people reading it, especially um, because F1 people know their stuff. I mean, they have it all. Um, so for me to try and explain, for example, aerodynamics, one of the first things on the, the A to Z, in quite a concise way, once you've had a stroke, uh, it's tough. It's tough. Um, and there are people that could do it far better than I can. But for some reason, they wanted me to do it. Um, and I, I feel like I've... I've I've tried to make it as concise and understandable for someone who doesn't know this world of sport and F1 and fun and informative for people who do. And getting that balance is really hard um, when you're trying to write for the whole audience of F1 and new fans, fans that have been there for decades. Um, but hopefully there is something for everyone in there and, and hopefully it, it makes sense. I believe it does. And, and I've had some lovely reviews, which has been really nice. It feels like everyone's supporting me. Yeah, no, they are for sure. I mean, it's, it's such an amazing achievement and um, yeah, just congratulations. Uh, so, so the, the book is kind of geared for everybody that you, you just said that now I was just wondering to like jog your memory uh, in the, in the initial sort of parts of writing the book, did you go back and watch like videos of yourself or, or anything like that? No, I still find it really hard to watch anything of myself. Um, just because I feel like, uh, certainly at the start, I didn't sound like myself. I didn't, I didn't look like myself. There was nothing that would be gained from doing that. No, it was just a case of um, sitting down and, and trying to focus on what was inherently in me and just getting those words and information out I mean I've spent the last what 15 years learning all these things um and it was just a case of simply checking some facts making sure I was on the right path and and doing my research of a, a lot of um understanding um and trying to work out what I wanted to say and that was the hardest thing is actually once you've had a stroke, the, sometimes the words don't come out right. The, the sentences don't come out right. So it's just really trying to work on that and, and nail down, right, what is it you're actually trying to say and say it and get it down and, and let's see what it's going to be. Yeah, well, well then, I mean, that tenacious spirit uh, definitely reaps its rewards for you. So I just, my, my sort of second last question is, um, what, what are you like, what have you got coming up? What are you most excited about? Oh, good question. Um, well now the book's kind of out there, 
Um, I don't really have like a massive target and a focus and I'm still very much like daily driven um, rather than looking at a massive like distance because I can't, I can't do that physically and, and mentally. I'm not able to think about a long-term goal but I, I'm just, I'm very keen to do more work in the stroke arena and do more charity work um, so that I can actually get that mass- message out. Um, and, you know, hopefully back to more races next year, going to more races um, and, and juggling that time of family time and work time and, and time that my health is still you know, central to my recovery and, and nailing my recovery. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a, a very good answer, but I, I don't know what the future holds. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a massive turning point ahead of me. I just don't know. So I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time worrying about that. I'm just more focused on, right. What am I doing today? What am I doing recovery wise? What am I doing work-wise and what am I doing family-wise and just trying to get that that sorted I think if more people thought that way like just the present moment once again it would just make for a I don't know maybe a bit more of a a peaceful world and uh yeah because we're either worried about stupid things we did in the past or things that are probably not going to happen in the future and uh, we forget about just living in the present moment so I think it's a it's a great answer and a, a really important thing for people to to think about for their own lives. And my last question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? (laughs) I think um, over the last just under two years, um, I've proved myself that I can come back from the worst adversity almost that you can uh, try and comprehend. And the body is able to do something ridiculous. Um, and it almost feels unhuman in what what I've been able to achieve. Um, and I just I just wish that whatever you are recovering from, it doesn't matter what it is, but I hope that um, your body, your brain, your mind, your resilience, can take you to a place that will help you recover. Jenny, I just want to say like a massive thanks for for coming on the show. I think the message that you just shared with us now is really important. Like never underestimate the the strength of your of your own body, uh, obviously physically, um, also of your own mental capacity, uh, of your own mindset. Like literally, you are clearly this extremely strong. A mindseted person and I would say that that was a, a huge part of your your recovery was because you decided to get after it but you're also just like a very inspiring woman um, not just for women but for everybody uh, in terms of what you've done what you've achieved and uh, you know what you what you what you're going to achieve in in the world and I just just wanted to say a massive massive thanks I still have to kind of pinch myself a little bit that I'm speaking to you and I just wish you all the best and your recovery has been amazing from an outsider. Uh, you, there doesn't seem to be like anything wrong with you whatsoever. So um, hopefully that means a little bit. And I just, yeah, thank you for your time and wish you a great day. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure.